Um, ten years prior to the uh, start of the new international economic order, uh, UNCTAD was created. So next year we are um, celebrating our 60th anniversary along with the creation of the uh, G77 that was uh, co-established with the formation of UNCTAD uh, back, in the, back in 1964. And of course it's no accident that over that ten years a, cer a certain momentum was built for uh, the beginnings of a meaningful dialogue between the North and the South over in issues of the structure and direction of the international economy. Uh, UNCAD spent 10 years essentially with a, with a reform, an attempt to reform the rules of the game that were established immediately at the end of the Second, uh, Second World War through Bretton Woods and, and through the, uh, the GATT and other fora. And with some success, UNCAD was the institution that was responsible for making special drawing rights a universal reserve asset rather than a much narrower one, which was what was conceived by the G10 back in the early 60s. We were the institution that created the 0.7% the ODA target, which has never been met, of course, but, but, but was an important initiative. We created the G24, the group of developing countries that uh, negotiates. Uh, in, in, in Washington, uh, we created, we, we pushed for the general service, uh, the, the, the general agreement on, the, on, 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 on preferences, what's it called, the Vahini, the, 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 on, uh, the attempt to have asymmetric symmetries, uh, trade preferences in the WTO. We added special and differential treatment to the negotiations in GATT. We uh, ne negotiated shipping agreements that had some positive impact on the role of developing countries in, in the design of rules on, on shipping. We created the least developed countries as a group to negotiate in the UN. But none of this was very satisfactory in terms of its impact. Indeed, we, at least in our own history, the term New International Economic Order was coined by Raoul Prebisch, the inspiration for UNCTAD, at the second UNCTAD conference in New Delhi, in many respects out of frustration of what he hadn't achieved in, in his short tenure um, in, as, as the head of UNCTAD. And I guess that raises a question really, given he did raise that idea of a much more systemic agenda to reform the, the international economic system. What, what did it require for that idea to really take hold in the 1970s and generate a genuine dialogue between the North and the South that, at least for a, for a, a, a period of time, suggested a fundamental shift in the way in which the international, the global uh, economy was, was, was organized and governed. And, and I guess it's fairly obvious what the conditions you, need, you needed for that to happen. The first one was that the, the existing rules of the game were in trouble. The North was slowing down, distributional struggles were mounting, uh, conflicts within the advanced economies were emerging over the governance of the international economy, the rise of the European economies as major trading economies, uh, growing deficits in the United States, uh, inappropriate macro and financial policies in the US linked to the uh, the Vietnam War, and ultimately the willingness of the United States to go it alone by um, uh, derailing the system that it had created in Bretton Woods by removing the link between the dollar and the gold, and ultimately the end of the fixed exchange rate system, which was done uni unilaterally by the United States. It was, there was no discussion with the Europeans, which angered the Europeans, of course, at the time. So there was a lot of conflict within the, within the advanced economies over how this global economy was being, government, was being government, governed. For developing countries, just sheer frustration out of their attempt to move away from being essentially commodity exporters, which most of them were for the, for the 1960s and into the 1970s. They, they wanted to move out of commodities into uh, diversifying into industrial development, which they found that the rules of the international economy were not helping, problems in, in terms of technology transfer, problems in terms of the way in which commodity markets were governed and the kinds of resources that 
that they benefited from exporting uh, basic uh, primary commodities, lack of access to northern markets in terms of the industrial goods that they were trying to produce, and just a whole set of things that made their efforts to diversify and upgrade their economies all the more difficult. And of course, that's where Ongtan stepped in with a narrative about how you bring together uh, the asymmetries and biases in the global economy and, and forge a kind of story that could speak across the developing world. I mean, Brazil was a completely different economy from, from uh, Benin in those, time, in those days, and you needed a common narrative, and UNCTAD provided that common narrative about how the developing world was suffering from these uh, intrinsic asymmetries and, and biases. Um, so that was an incredibly important part, I think, of building a dialogue between the North and the South. But it wasn't enough. Clearly, leadership mattered. And you had not only personalities in the South that could push a common narrative. I mean, if you think of Latin America with Echeverria, with, with Fidel, with Michael Manley in Jamaica, you had in Africa, you had uh, Boumidien, you had Nereri. In Asia, you had... Bhutto, you had Gandhi, you had Mao, of course, and China had joined the G77 by then. It wasn't originally a member of the G77 because China was not included as part of the UN system. At least mainland China was not. So you had these personalities that were willing to push a common agenda. And of course, you had the institutions that were backing a common agenda. That was, that was obviously true of UNCLAN, but the G77 was a, was a solidaristic and, and relatively powerful political bloc that had learned over the previous 10 years how to negotiate and how to uh, confront the, 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 the alternative that was being thrown at them by the advanced economies. And you had, of course, OPEC, as David mentioned that, as the economic muscle uh, behind, behind that. And I think very importantly, so, so, you had the, so you had the narrative, you had the leadership, and in a sense, you had the alliances within the South. I mean, one of the things that was important, I think, to understanding why we got the dialogue, at least from my interpretation of that history, is that European social democracy still mattered. There, was a, there, were, there were countries within Europe in particular, and not just the Scandinavians who are always mentioned in this context, but countries like the Netherlands, countries like Italy, who were willing to side with developing countries on some of the issues of pressing concern to those countries. And so there was a potential to have uh, serious alliances that could be the backstop of an ongoing uh, dialogue and discussion about how to make serious and systemic reforms to the global economy. So, so that combination of, of narrative of, uh, of leadership and, and, and of alliances, I think, were the prerequisites to the kind of dialogue that emerged in the 70s around the idea of a new international economic order. So I guess, and I don't want to go into why that failed. I think most of the, peop most of the people here know why that failed. The question, I guess, we ask ourselves in this context, well, what, what is, is that combination of forces still uh, present today or available today to kind of reignite a similar kind of discussion around the problems that developing countries and indeed advanced economies are facing. And we all know the problems are very intense. We all know the problems cannot be solved one country at a time. They need some sort of multilateral response if they're going to be met. And, and, and you know, whether you, whether you frame that as a poly crisis, and it is interesting that the, the three big issues that, that motivated the new international economic order, food insecurity, fuel and financial imbalance are the very, in, very issues that continue to resonate uh, today, and people call this the poly crisis. It's not a phrase I particularly like. In addition, you have, of course, the climate challenge that over, over kind of interacts and, 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 uh, and intensifies those, those problems. Um, on top of that, I think, uh, but it's not just the poly crisis, I think, that we're talking about here, because the problems of the global economy and the imbalances that developing countries face, whether that's inequality, whether that's indebtedness, whether that's uh, insufficient uh, investment, whether that's insecurity. I mean, these are problems that are rooted in, the, in the, at least the decade uh, after the global financial crisis. And many of us, including many of us in UNCTAD, expected that crisis to provide the motivation and catalyst 
for a real fundamental revisiting of the kind of system that had emerged post-1980 and to see real reform and systemic reform that would benefit developing countries. And of course, it never happened after the global, after the global financial crisis. We got the SDGs, we got the Paris Agenda, all of which are important and aspirations that we all, I think, uh, would agree to, but never a discussion of the rules and the policies that were needed to actually put those kind of aspirations into a meaningful framework to deliver on them. Um, so, so, you know, there's a, there's a kind of concern there that we don't yet, I think, have the kind of narrative that, the kind of narrative that we had in the 1970s that could bring together different voices in, in, into a kind of coherent um, vision of how we can uh, move forward in a more inclusive, sustainable uh, way that Carolina talked about in her, in her presentation. Um, leadership, the leadership question remains a serious question, I think. I think we have not had leadership from the South for, for at least two decades or more. There are signs, I think, we are seeing leadership. I was at the Paris, the Macron summit a couple of weeks ago, and I think what took Macron and some of the other people from the advanced economies a little bit, to my surprise, was the strength of voices coming from the South, not just Mia Mobley, who has achieved that status over the last few years, but other, other voices from the South that I think indicate that there's a, there's a budding kind of leadership there that, that, that needs to be tapped into. Um, Institutionally, I think the, 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 the South remains fragmented, UNCTAD remains weak. The South Center that Ine may talk about this is not the institution that it was uh, two decades ago. You have a multiplicity of fora, you have G20 where you have developing countries, you have, you have uh, G90 in the WTO, you have B20, you have BRICS. There's a lot of incoherence still at an institutional level in the South, but there are stirrings at the regional level, new institutions emerging from the South at the regional level that we see as being a, a, a potential source of, uh, of uh, institutional strength that needs to be tapped into. Um, so there are positive signs, both in terms of narrative and leadership, that we need to build on in this kind of fora. Alliances are a problem. The European social democracy is not, to put it mildly, is not what it was. And, in, in, and, is, in, and if anything, is an obstacle to a more progressive agenda, I think, today. And that's a real, that's a real worry. Um, NGOs are a new feature. They weren't really there in the kind of way they, they are today. Back in the 70s, we didn't deal with NGOs in Hong Kong so much. We have to deal with that. We have to bring them into a, to, to this narrative, and how we do that will be important. Labor, which was a, in some respects was a, was a challenge for developing, northern labor was a challenge for developing countries back in the 1970s, now suffers from the same problems that we associate with, the, with, with developing countries. Informality, uh, uh, fragmentation of labor markets, dual labor markets, these are the, the problems of the South are, not, are now very much reflected in the, in the way in which the labor have been treated over the last three decades in the North. So how we bring labor into this coalition and, and story, I think, is a critical and still under underthought part of the dialogue that needs to take place if we're going to build this inclusive, sustainable and just uh, and just world. So let me think let me finish with one.